my name's Amy Atzel. I live in Minneapolis now, but I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Went to college, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I've been doing taxes since 2010. I started, but I started my um, solo practice in, in 2016. And I was really blessed to, um, somebody mentioned Springboard for the Arts, which is a, a Minneapolis uh, organization that sent me a whole bunch of business my first year um, as a solo practitioner. So 80% of my clientele are artists from the Minneapolis area. And then I have um, other freelancers and just people who have normal jobs. So I do taxes, actually I do taxes for S corporations, partnerships, and sole proprietors, and all kinds of taxes, except for C corporations. I haven't, haven't done that yet. In my first life, I was a scientist, and I'm still a violinist, but there, um, I, I did spend seven years working at a law firm as an in-house scientific consultant uh, for patents, trademarks, and someone was mentioning earlier the need for, I don't know, um, more knowledge in that area, so I just wanted to throw that out there that I do have a lot of experience in patents and other intellectual property. So today, we're gonna talk about what, what are best practices for individuals and businesses, how to set yourself up and, and start some good habits and maintain them. Then we'll talk about how, how to implement some of this. And then, so that you're not intimidated or feel overwhelmed by this information, I'm gonna talk about time management because it's really not rocket science. It's all m mostly about organization. So, best thing to do, and these are best practices, they're not absolutes, but this is what I recommend for everyone, is to separate business from personal. When I say business, I mean anything, I mean self-employment, contracting, freelance work, I'm gonna call it business. So when you're working for yourself. Opening up a separate bank account is, is just like the beginning. So anytime you earn money, whether it's cash, Venmo, PayPal, somebody writes you a check or maybe you take credit cards, all of that freelance income ought to go into your business bank account. I'm just gonna call it business bank account. It doesn't need to be officially commercial, um, but another bank account that you just nickname, this is my art business or this is my freelance business because all of your money should go into that account that you earn on a freelance basis. And then all of your expenses should be paid out of that account as well. How do you do that? Well, you have a separate debit card or a separate credit card that's associated with the account, and it's all about cleaning up your, your, your business from your personal, separating them to the best that you can. Even, you know, things fall through the cracks, but um, if you can do that, you'll be um, better off. You don't have to have an LLC. You can be a sole proprietor. Mathematically, it's gonna end up being the same. So there's a, we'll get into what, what the other tax forms are. Um, as an LLC, however, you have the option of being, you know, treating yourself or treating your tax return like a sole proprietor. That's what I mean by mathematically everything's the same. But as an LLC, you have an option of electing S corporation status. But that's a commitment, and we can talk about that um, maybe later if somebody, some of you have questions. But that's a, a tax-saving um, measure that you, can, that you can implement. The other very, very important thing is to find a record-keeping system, bookkeeping system that works 
for you. I get a lot of people who call me up and say, oh, it's, it's, it's such a mess, I don't know. You know, they come in with boxes of receipts and things. And that's, that's not, that's, that's the very beginning. You have to find a, a system that works for you. On your table, I think there's some handouts, a spreadsheet. Spreadsheet is free. You can use QuickBooks, you can use other apps. There's all kinds of software out there to track your spending. But tracking it is, is very important. People call me up and say, well, what do I do? I, I made some uh, freelance money as a, as a musician or a, an artist and I don't know what to do. And so I, I don't know what to do about taxes. Well, I said, okay. I ask them, well, what's your profit? What have you, what have you brought in? Oh, I don't know. And when they can't answer questions, I, I'm like, okay, well, we have to find this information first. I can't help you if you don't have the information. So organizing it is important. And this is, and having, having a system that you can that you you can do in less than two hours a month this is what i allocate for myself to do my own book camping is two hours a month so if if it takes you longer than that then find a new system i'm hyper efficient i'm hopelessly efficient and hopelessly practical and this is, this is what I tell people, and I know it's like, a, for artists, you wanna be, it's not a, a space where your brain wants to be. But you can do that for two hours a month, okay? You're gonna be very practical for two hours a month um, just to keep your records together. Okay, one thing I wanna just talk about um, is what, what the concept of profit, because I ask people, what's your, what's your profit? They're like, oh, well, I brought in $20,000. Okay, well, how much did you spend in expenses? I don't know. Well, you weren't tracking. So in order to help you with taxes, because it's the profit that becomes taxable, this is why record keeping is so important. So for example, what is profit? This is very simple. You have 20,000 in gross income. Can come from any different, many different sources or it can maybe it can be one grant that you've received, 20,000. If you spend 5,000 in, in expenses, supplies, transportation, all these things, then you have 15,000 in profit and your taxes will be based on the profit. Another person who has 20,000 in income and then let's just say 19,000 in expenses only has $1,000 in profit and isn't gonna pay a whole lot of taxes on that, okay? So, down at the bottom. Yeah, so Schedule C is something that goes right into your normal tax return. As a sole proprietor or an LLC, you just, it just goes with it. And it can include your W-2 income because that goes on the regular 1040, right? So a lot of people have day jobs and a side hustle, okay? So they're doing both. But we do want to separate W-2 income, that's gonna be personal income, it's not part of your business. So Schedule C, back to Schedule C, there's gonna be no W-2 income on the Schedule C. It's for non-employee income, so all your freelancing, your art, your contracting, your consulting and teaching only. And that's why I put that spreadsheet together. Maybe, maybe that's next, yes. Um, and this is a very detailed slide, but I'm gonna take some time with it because this is sort of the found, this is what I give to all my clients and I ask them to please fill it out. <laughs> or something very similar. So the top of this 
and, and guess what? It has 12 months. So you're going to do this every month. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna fill in the January column on February 1st. Why? Because January's over with. Nothing else can happen in January. You're not going to have any more income. You're not going to have any more expenses. It's done. So if you fill that out, then, you're, then you've accomplished your bookkeeping for that month. So if you can spend two hours filling this out each month on the first, and I, I, I have a calendar reminder that I use, and I even set my alarm clock earlier. If I have something somewhere to be at 9 a.m. and I need to do my books on the first, I get up early just to do that. That's how committed I am. <laughs> Not everyone is, but this is just one way that, you can, that it can be done. And this is part of the time management aspect too. So up at the top, we've got income, and you can, you can edit this. This is a spreadsheet that you can edit to make, to tailor to what your business does. So you might have services income, you might have sales, you might have grants. What else? Other sources of income. But you wanna, you wanna make sure you're noting that every single month. Because when December, January, the next year comes around, you're trying to file your tax return, you don't know the answers to these things, it's harder to go back for the, you know, throughout the whole year and try to recreate the year. So keeping up with your bookkeeping is very important. And then underneath that, we've got expenses. And these, this is just a template. It can be edited. So... You've got your advertising and promotion. That's the, that's, everyone has that. Um, phone, internet, you know, keep track of that. A lot of people are, um, say, oh, I don't know how much I use my phone for business or personal. I'm, I'm, and I tell them, figure it out. Take some time, take a few days, take a week, whatever, kind of measure it come up with a good proportion. For some people, it's like 90% because they're workaholics. For some people, it's more like 50%. You know, if you work from home, then you're using your, your home internet quite a bit. So don't, don't forget these things. That's another important part is don't leave out any expenses. There's no reason to omit anything, right? You, you don't want to inflate your profit why? You pay more taxes, right? Um, so, so the, and, and, and this is another reason to keep, keep doing this every month because people will be like, oh, I, mean, I, I had a, a business dinner and I did, forgot to write that down or I, I, I did a lot of um, driving to a, you know, a certain client and I didn't write that down. And you know, some things we can go back and recreate, but a lot of things fall through the cracks if you don't uh, write that down immediately or at least every month. So what else do we have? You know, just your supplies. You might have insurance. You know what your business is and, and how you're spending your money. The other nice thing about this system, the spreadsheet system, is that you can see, you know, after you've done it for the whole year, you've got a tool, an analytical tool to look back on. It's like, oh, look how I, I spent $500 in June on advertising, and it worked really well. If you spent $500 in January on advertising, maybe it didn't work so well. You'll be able to see trends about what, about what sort of effect your, uh, your activities are having on your business and how can you maximize or increase your profit on that. Some people are in business building mode, so they spend more than they take in. That happens to everybody. I think the, 
the first few years when you're starting out, you're, you're investing, you're, you're spending a lot of your money, and you guess what? You have negative, you, it, it's a loss. You have business losses. That's normal, it's okay. You can still put it on your tax return. And it will, it'll be a subtraction, you know, against whatever other income you might have. And then, so those are the expenses. And then below that, as a sole proprietor or a, a, a single, um, you know, member LLC, there are other things that are important for your tax return that aren't part of your business, such as, so you might have self-employed health insurance. You're paying for it out of your own pocket. You might use an exchange or, or some private insurance, but I want to know that because self-employed health insurance is a tax deduction. If you have retirement accounts, if you're regularly contributing, need to know that because most of those are pre-tax meaning they can be subtracted from your taxable income and you get a tax break and you get to save for retirement. Oh yes, mileage. This is, this is one thing that, that people, most people don't do very well. There are apps out there or unless, you know, if, if you're very organized, you can, you can keep on top of this, but I think mi mileage can be a, a very good tax deduction, but you gotta have some re records for that. And then home office as well, just need square feet. If you're a renter, you can um, write, write off a portion of your utilities, your renter's insurance, and your rent. As homeowners, it's a little bit different, and I can, I can talk more about that. And then finally, and I promise I'll, I'm gonna move on from this slide, um, quarterly tax payments. If you're doing those, you wanna write them down, and those are the, it's April, June, September, and I, and January, although I recommend that people do this in December, pay their last quarter in December. Okay. Questions about the, about the spreadsheet or Well, you know, so you can use your own social security number. You can get an EIN without having an LLC. You can have an EIN as a sole proprietor as well. Just your name. You can apply for an EIN just, just as a sole proprietor. So you can use your social security number or you can use an EIN. If you're in, let's see. Actually, you can have an LLC without having an EIN either. But I actually recommend getting, an EIN means employer tax ID number. So it's like a social security number, but it's for your business entity. And if you're a sole proprietor, then you are your own business entity and you can get an EIN or FEIN. Does that answer your question? Oh, okay, I already talked about this, but I just want to emphasize from a time management perspective, make it a habit. Just do it. First of every month, get up in the morning. It's the first thing you do, and don't stop until you're done. And then you can have your coffee. <laughs> no, with your coffee. And I'm only saying this because this is, this is, I know it can be done because I can do it. <laughs> okay, so back to the home office. I just want to tell you what it, what it is. It's not your kitchen table. It's not your bed. You're sitting there with your laptop working. It's not, it's not that. It's not your sofa. It does not need to be a separate room 
but it needs to be a dedicated space in your home used regularly and exclusively, and this is the language that the IRS uses, it comes, comes from case law, regularly and exclusively for business. So what I tell people is whether you're renting or in your own home, it's just your table. It could, it could be just the, the size of your table and your chair. That's where you work. And you put virtual masking tape on the floor, you measure that square footage, that's your home office. And when you're at work, you're working. And when you're, or when you're inside the, 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 the masking tape. So when you're, when you're outside, then you're not working anymore. So it's like an office, but it's just part of your home. Um, and, well, it can be a separate building if you have a whole garage or even a, a, an outbuilding out back. It can be that. It can be the whole thing. And all you really need to know is the square, the square feet of that space and the square feet of your home. Questions about what home office is or isn't? Some, some of my clients will say, oh, I don't really have a home office, um, so I won't make that, you know, we're not gonna do that. I'm, I'm like, okay, so next year, let's make sure you do have a home office. So moving forward, we wanna establish a home, home office so that we can get that tax deduction and your, my, your business mileage is related to that. Because every time you drive from your home office to a location, a gig location, a work location, that will be deductible business mileage. I want to contrast that with commuting. If you have a W-2 job and you live at, you live at home like everybody, and then you drive to your W-2 job, that's considered commuting. It's not deductible business mileage. If you, if you go from a W-2 job to a gig job, that can be deductible business mileage. When you go from your home office to a gig location, that's deductible business mileage. So that's why it's better to have a home office because that way, you're, that way your mileage can be deducted. Of course, if you're going out of town, that, that's travel mileage, so that's okay. Speaking of mileage, so this has to be your own vehicle, your personal vehicle. And as I was just saying, it's from work location to work location to work location to work location. It's never from home to anywhere. That's commuting. Home to anywhere is commuting. Work to work to work to work is business mileage. That's why home office is important. Um, yeah, and, the, and it's calculated, it changes every year, sometimes more than once a year, but approximately 57 cents per mile. You don't need to track gasoline or repairs or anything like that. Standard mileage rate is, is usually the best tax deduction. If you're in a, a, the kind of a business where you drive all the time or you have a, a van that's you know, devoted to the business, then we can uh, you know, start to include things like repairs <clears throat> and, and, and other things. So there, there's alternatives to the standard mileage rate. Leasing is fine. Doesn't matter if you own it. It's still standard mileage rate. That's okay. As long as it's a personal vehicle and you're using it for, for work purposes. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna obviously use it for personal, personal, personal reasons. 
And that's why it's important to know which portion of that is business and which is personal. So that's why tracking the mileage is important. But it, need, it needs to be like someone will, you can't, you can't borrow a car, borrow your friend's car and run, run errands and stuff and count that as mileage. Okay, because it's not yours. Yeah. So, can you write off, so say you lease a vehicle for your business and the majority of the... I, I have some clients who are, who are couriers, okay? They drive hundreds of miles every day. They have huge mileage deductions. It really works for them, right? Um, and they will, and they calculate their total mileage for the year, and their business mileage. As long as we know all of those figures, we can determine what's. It doesn't matter if it's leased or not. In other words. Here's another thing that um, my clients let fall through the cracks a lot. When you're out networking, buying coffee with people that, that, that you want to uh, sell things to or go into partnership with, or any time you're discussing business or the hope of a future relationship or anything that's business related, that, that can be a business uh, a lunch or a business dinner or meal, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> it's not you eating by yourself, thinking about work. <sighs> even, even if, in, in, in my, I have clients who work in the theater and they're like, yeah, but I, I had, in between, I had a double header that day and in between I had to go eat. And uh, I'm like, well, Everyone's responsible for feeding themselves, right? That's not a business. That's not a business lunch because you. I mean, if you were with your colleagues discussing business, then yes, or the arts or whatever. But if it's just you um, eating in between shows or something, that's that's not a business deduction. I think people get confused by that. But. Regardless, don't let it slip through, through the cracks because you'll miss a lot of little things. A few hundred dollars a year you might miss uh, as a tax deduction. Save your receipts. You know, th this is, you know, in the unlikely event that you get audited by the IRS, um, you just want to be able to back it up the best that, that you can. And mileage and meals are something that, if you do get audited, those are things that might change if you don't have the <clears throat> um, paperwork to back it up. So that's just a word of, of advice and caution. Yes? So um, how would you prove your mileage? If you're saying keep receipts for your meals, yeah. you tell us not keep receipts for gas. So we say, One really good way is to have one of those apps like called Mile IQ. There's some, I don't think Mile IQ is free, but there are some other apps out there. I think there might be some free ones out there that will, uh, and the, the nice thing about um, these apps is that they, they track it. It's a third party. The nice thing about that, it's a third party. It's not your honor system saying, I drove 2,000 miles for work and I have no record of it, right? So the apps provide a third-party record of your mileage. I've heard, I've heard people talk about this in other, like, you know, IRS events and how do, we, how do we do this, and they talk about mileage apps, and so it's accepted. That's, that's just an, an accepted way. You can also do it the old-fashioned way, write it down, have a log sitting in your car and <laughs> with, you know, 
this is my mileage every day, and you write it down with a, with a pen, and that works too. Um, I don't know how likely that is for anyone to do, but if, even if you can write down where you went on a certain day, you can go back and Google map it and write that down. As long as you have something to ha hang your hat on, um, that's, the, that's really the best practice. It's a great, uh, you know, when you're, especially right now, you're out of town, you get in, a, in an Uber to, to go to the airport uh, from the hotel. If it's a business meeting, it's a business deduction. Absolutely. Even if it's in town, if your car broke down, you don't have a way of, of getting where you need to go, you, uh, you know, take an Uber or Lyft, that's a business deduction. Yes. Just a nice gesture. <laughs> just say, just say yes. <laughs> just say yes. It's really on on whoever's hosting it to make sure that they are writing off the meal that they paid for you, right? It's the it's the flip side of that. What else? Oh, yes. Traveling. So here we are, all are traveling. We're away from home for three days. We should make sure everyone here writes down that they stayed three nights out of town, what city they went to, and then we will calculate your per diem travel meals. Okay. It has nothing to do with air, air, uh, airfare or, or hotel rooms or anything. It has to do with, it's just, it's just a system that's kind of like the standard mileage rate, but it has to do with traveling. And you have to stay overnight. So let's say you, if you go on a day trip, you know, maybe three hours away, and you come back home on the same day, that's not business travel. Business travel is where, where you go and s stay the night and then come back. That would be one night. You sh if you really want to uh, do it right, you will calculate, you'll, you'll keep track of the, what you spent on meals while you were traveling, and then we will compare it to what the per diem rate is for that city. So if you, if you happen to be in Europe for a business meeting, those per diem rates are really high, like 120 bucks a night. You know, a, a small town in Minnesota would be about 54 bucks a, 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 a for a per diem. So it, it's location dependent. And Let's just say you were uh, entertaining some fancy people and you spent a whole lot of money that was more than the per diem rate, then you can take that as a deduction. Okay, so you don't have to limit yourself to what the per diem rate is. You can take the actual rate of what you spent. So, the majority of the time, you're probably spending $20, $30 a day on food or something, but you get to take a $50, $50 tax deduction or even, even more. So track your travel. Only if they're involved in the business in some way. If they're, you know, with you, um, just with you, then that's not that's not part of the calculation. I 
think we all got per diem. So that that's to help you with you know spending what whatever you needed to spend to get to to here you know from the airport all these incidental expenses they're helping you with that but that does not change your tax deduction for Santa Fe both so one doesn't cancel the other one out it's a good it's a good question i think a lot of people get confused by that See what's next. Ooh. I have a question. Yes. Or what I do when I travel, I use the GSA per diem rate, and then when you, and so like for each day, I do first and last day, three quarters, and that's how I keep it as a record. And then when you enter it on, Same thing. Um, it's it's easier to do the 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 per diem thing, and you're right. It's a GSA. It's a it's a government. Um, it, it, they publish it every year, and they change the rates every year. And it's a job for me because I do have some clients, some rock and roll clients that do. Guess what? World tours. So I have another version of this spreadsheet that I give to them that has 365 rows. I say, what city? How many nights? And so there, and they, there, there'll be 365 different entries on that spreadsheet. And guess who looks up the per diem rate for each, uh, you know, so it's a big job. And the fact that you're looking it up yourself is great because I, it's, uh, it's, it's quite tedious. Um, and you get to know what they are after a while, you know, if you, you know, okay, they went to LA twice. Okay. I remember that, you know, so, um, You don't want to miss that because when you're doing a world tour, you're not tracking much of anything. <laughs> you're just trying to get to the next place. So it's nice that that this is available. So yeah. Okay. I wanted to. Why did I come back to this? Anyway, I'll just go on. Oh. The right side of this spreadsheet. So we've spent a whole year filling this out. We get up on the first of the month. We fill this out. And the end of December, it's New Year's Day. We're doing our total column, right? We're going to see what our total income and our total expenses were for the year. And, and if you don't know if you're profitable, then I mean, you'll, you'll find out. <laughs> um, and it's really funny because I'd say a, a good half of my clients don't know if they're making a profit or not. I mean, they have a W-2 job and they do this on the side, but they're not tracking it. So they don't know if they're going to owe taxes or if they're going to get money back. And this... this um, mystery tears them apart, right? They're like, oh, I'm so scared to do my taxes. I'm so scared. I don't know what's going to happen. Am I going to owe a lot of money? Am I going to... And um, it doesn't need to be that way. It really doesn't need to be that way. Um, knowledge is power. As long as, long as you know what, what you've done for the year, you'll know. Um, if you're if you're in the profit zone, or, or if you've if you've invested in your business a lot, if you're at a at a loss, 
that'll be a nice, nice tax deduction. But it doesn't need to be um, mysterious and scary and and because the information is there, right? The information is there. You just gotta put it in the right place. The total, I'm sorry, the total column. I'm going to take the total income, and then I'm going to take each category of expense. And guess what? This goes on. This is the Schedule C that I was talking about. It's part of your regular tax return. There is, if you'll look over to the right, uh, up at the top, there's this place for an EIN. She was asking about your social security number or your EIN. This, this page right here, you can be a sole proprietor or you can be an LLC, okay? That's just gonna be the same. If you have an EIN, I'll put it in. If you don't, then I won't, all right? Another thing, um, and there's this checkbox here about, were you required to file any 1099s? for the people that you paid, yes or no? So we gotta figure that question out too. As a business owner, even if you're freelancing, you, when you pay, if you pay another person $600 or more, guess what? You've gotta give them a tax document called a 1099 NEC. NEC stands for non-employee compensation. When you work for someone else, as, a, as an artist, um, sometimes you, or even if you're you know, teaching or instructing or something, you will get a 1099 that has no taxes taken out of it, right? And it'll be for something over $600. There's a lot of things that go under the radar, right? If you didn't get paid $600 or more, then you may not receive a 1099 and you may have no record of your income. That's your responsibility. Even if you have no tax document, it's still your responsibility to know how much cash you brought in. Because guess what? You're gonna deposit that into your business bank account or you're gonna at least write write it down that you earned cash. If you earn $500 in cash, that's still income. Just because nobody knows about it doesn't mean it's not income. <laughs> so anyway, that's enough of that. Um, yes, yeah, so don't forget, and, and 1099s that you give to other people, are, they need to be filed by the end of January, like all other tax documents. Every, people forget, right? Still do it, even if you have to do it late, do it, because it's, a, it's just a part of compliance. Yeah, everything that you pay this person goes on the 1099. It's up to them to deduct those expenses. There is a sort of a, um, it's, it, it's, it's about accounting, just accounting practices. Yes, it's gonna have a zero effect. So let's just say you gave someone $100 for gas and they spent exactly $100 on gas. That's gonna have a zero effect on the tax return, but we've reported the accounting correctly. So some of that does go under the radar. Let's just say you paid them $1,000 and you didn't include the rest of it like you were telling me. Um, they shouldn't be deducting those expenses, right? So it was just a matter of an accounting principle there. Remember those total columns? 
Number one, the line one here. Yeah. That's where that, that figure goes. So everything that you deposited in your bank account and all the cash that you didn't deposit into your bank account goes on that line, the total. And I'm not, I'm not going to talk about cost of goods sold in, unless we, you know, get into that discussion later. So we're going to talk about to yeah, just total income. And then below here, part two, is where the spreadsheet expenses come from. And you'll notice that my spreadsheet does not match word for word this, uh, these, this list here. There's another page uh, down at the bottom where it says other expenses is where I outline other things like, oh, postage. Why don't they put postage on that list? I don't know. But for the most part, I'll try to fill out things like um, advertising and um, travel, especially travel and things. So this is, where, this is where, the, where we apply the spreadsheet to your tax return. It's easy. Once you've got your totals, you just plug it in here. So you can do this on your own. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Um, there's some on the tables, and those are, those are just printouts, but there, there's an email circulating with all of my slides and all of my handouts, and some of the handouts didn't make it. But um, yes, there is a copy of this, and you can even go to my website and download this very same spreadsheet. I don't know if it got sent out or not, if you sent out all of my... Yes. You know, I have um, so every, not every year, but every once in a while, I, I, I look at how many different states, and I think it's, a, I think I do about 25 different states, Mostly in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa. I have plenty of California clients. Be your first Where? Be your first Montana, Montana. Yes, absolutely. Love that. Um, uh, yeah, New York and California. Very difficult tax return. The, the the state tax returns in those states are more complicated than the federal tax returns. So. If you said California, I might say no. I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> and then, real quick, I know I, I know uh, people are like getting bored now, but um, down at the bottom is where. So, if you have a positive number down on line like 28 or 29 or whatever, 15 more minutes. Okay. If you have a positive number, and you have a home office then your home office will reduce your profit. If you don't have a profit, your home office will not make your negative number more negative. Does that make sense? Okay. Way down at the bottom, I think it might even be cut off, but let's just say it's line 31, that's going to be your business profit. And that, it goes on, let me just see if it's there, yeah. That goes on uh, line eight. Of, so when you're, when you're looking at a tax return, you're like, oh, what is all this stuff? You're going to see your uh, freelance income, your art income down on line eight, and it's going to be imported from that Schedule C. The schedule skis C will dictate that. Um, let me back up here. Yeah, I want to. I want to say a few more things about the pain of not knowing where your profit or loss is. So let's just say you have this fifteen thousand dollar profit. You're going to pay taxes. If you, if you live in Minnesota, you will pay federal taxes, state taxes, Social Security, and Medicare. The Social Security and Medicare 
is called SE or self-employment tax. Normally, if you have a W-2 job, your employer is taking care of half of it. Okay? As a self-employed person, you're taking care of all of it. All right? You, you do get to deduct half of it. It doesn't seem to amount to much, but you do get to deduct half of it. Some states don't have state income tax. Alaska? Yeah. Texas? Florida? Um, those places, what you'll, you'll file federal, uh, Tennessee even, I have plenty of clients in Tennessee, um, and those are nice because I only have one tax return to file. In Minnesota, there's three. You've got federal, state, and then property tax. Even renters get property tax refunds in Minnesota. I think people get most, uh, they feel the most pain when they don't know what they're, because uh, uh, they'll, they'll think, oh, maybe 10% of, of my profit is what I need to pay. No, they have forgotten about Social Security and Medicare, and that adds up. That's why it's also good to pay quarterly taxes. If you know you're going to be in this situation, you want to pay some quarterly taxes during the year so that you're not shocked and have this huge, huge bill all at one time. Okay, so we looked at that. Tax, quarterly taxes. So this is just a recommendation. So I, I have plenty of clients who never pay quarterly taxes. And I have a, a musician in Nashville who, who goes on world tours and all that kind of stuff. He's okay with paying $30,000 in taxes every year and not paying quarterly. He could be paying, you know, 10 here, 10 there, whatever. He just pays it all at once. It's too much of a, he's too busy. He's on the road, can't, can't do this kind of bookkeeping, you know. Uh, he would, he'd rather pay. And so there's, there is a little bit of penalty for not paying your taxes on time. So the tax system is pay as you earn. That's why when you have your withhold, withholding coming out of your paycheck, you're keeping up with your taxes pretty much. When you get paid as a contractor on a 1099, there's no taxes coming out and you should be paying taxes on that. If you don't, you're not gonna go to jail, but you will just pay a penalty, that's all. It might be 50 bucks, it might be a few hundred dollars, um, just depending on how much you owe. Uh, let's see. So, I, if, you, if you do have a profit, so this is not total income, but profit of more than 10,000, I do recommend paying estimated taxes. Well, how do you calculate that? This is just a rule of thumb that I give to m most of my clients who are in sort of a middle class uh, um, tax bracket send 15% of your profit to the IRS and then three to 5% profit of the profit to your state if you have to pay your state taxes. And you can pay, pay all this online. Um, I have, so my website, I, tr I try to make it uh, very useful. So payments, you can pay quarterly taxes. And there's just links, there are links on my website to um, to the IRS and where do you start when you want, when you need to pay your taxes, either pay your tax return or your quarterly taxes. There's links there. You can do it. I have people for people who aren't clients anymore who are still <laughs> going to my page, and and using those pages. Um, what else? It's also a good thing. So I'm thinking of my website now on the payments tab. Um, how, how many people have logged into their own IRS account? Created a login, and you know you can you can see what what you owe. You can see any notices, any nasty letters they sent you that you didn't get in the mail. They'll be there. And this is this is only a few years old. So the IRS is trying to modernize a little bit, <clears throat> and instead of answering the phone all the time or 
as we know, not answering the phone, that you can actually do some self-service and look these things up. So, and there's this kind of a pain in the butt authentication process, but get through it and do it so that you can uh, log on to your account. Uh, oh, just real quickly, um, more about time management because it's, it's not rocket science. It's actually very easy. Just do it. Set up a separate bank account. How long does that take? And with a separate credit card. Oh, four hours. Measure your home office right now. Do it now. Do your books every month. Two hours. Do your regular mileage tracking. And then you don't need to be overwhelmed by all this. <laughs> so the most important part, yeah, do, do the one-time setup. And then do your two hours a month bookkeeping and you'll be happy. By the end of the year, you'll be happier. Yes. So, um, I have a young son that's in his early 20s, musician, and he was in the mindset of like, wow, I didn't have to do any of this tax stuff. Cool cat that doesn't pay his taxes. <laughs> and, um, so that's he, cool. He, he started, you know, he did well, little gigs and all this stuff as well. So then comes a time where we're like, you gotta get out of the house. Well, he had income enough, enough, but he had no work history. So he couldn't access apartments when you apply for an apartment. Now, a little few later, he's done well. He's got, so if you're interested in things like even like a HUD 184 loan, home ownership, if you haven't done any of that to show that you have had income and a job, whether it's self proprietor LLC, and you think you're getting around this system, eventually it catches up. Yes. And it puts you in a bind because in his case, he needed two years of proven employment, whether again, and that's usually done when you, throw, you show it through your taxes. So even though the young whippersnapper thought he was getting away, it's come back to kind of hit him because he can't <coughs> access rental or, you know, in this case, now home ownership uh, because he, he didn't quite keep up with all of that. That's a really excellent point. So you can fly under the radar for, for a while and as a kid and, you know, do your thing and stuff. But it, it, like you're saying, it'll, it takes a little while to, to establish what you need to establish to, you know, just rent an apartment. I've written letters. You know, some of my clients that have moved to New York or something, they're like, hey, I'm trying to get, in a, you know, just, you know, find an apartment here. And they have, um, I don't want to call them headhunters, but... Um, people, you know, realtors that find you apartments and stuff. So it's a big racket in New York. You need letters of recommendation uh, for, you know, for self-employed people. It's like, okay, we need a letter from your, the person who prepared your taxes or some CPA who uh, can vouch for the fact that your Schedule C is valid. And that's a whole other thing that I don't want to go into is some of the shadiness that, that goes into, um, you know, preparing your tax return. Um, so you send them your tax return, you know, you give the, the, the leasing agent your tax return, and, um, and I write them a letter, and even people that are already homeowners, listen to this, already homeowners just wanting to refinance, okay? still want a letter from me saying that, yes, this person is a, you know, he, he's been a very successful uh, videographer for, you know, a couple of decades. He's self-employed. He has a um, S corporation. He does very, very, very well, but still needed, you know, some sort of letter from me. And that doesn't happen all the time. You know, I don't, you know, but um, yeah, they're looking, they, you know, they just want validation and verification from a third party, and, and, and the third party part is where I come in. So, yeah, I write a letter for that. So, yes, there was a question.
separate. Yeah, yeah. I know it's more, it's like duplicating the the work, but um, hopefully it'll just be a one year transition, and then everything will be on the S corp. Make sure that when you're getting paid, that you're giving them the S corp EIN number. Okay, so it has to do what you're talking about has to do with. Um, and if I'm going over, you just cut me off. Um, this, assigning assignment of income so things that are coming to you personally are under your own social security number you can't just put that on the s corp even though next year you will okay so for this year and and you might all you might have another kind of side hustle anyway at at any point in time you might you know get some money so yeah you, 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 it's all about cleanliness of separation. So yes, I've, I, have, I have a client who has three spreadsheets, you know, does that, you know, three times. He's got his own, he's a musician, he's also an artist, and he's also runs something where, um, that involves other people. So he has essentially three businesses and He's remarkable because he comes to me every year with the cleanest books in the world. And I, I trust everything that he puts in there. He, and guess what? He uses my spreadsheet. So that's why I trust him. Just kidding. <laughs> um, and there are, there are some people out there that, that do really well with QuickBooks and some other you know, software. I, I actually don't use QuickBooks. And I can't help you with that. But if you, if you know how to use it, and you give me a, a nice profit and loss statement, that's, that's golden. So yes, separate, separate. Maybe I should just stop. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just, I'll just say one, a couple of things. Don't forget about your future and when you turn 60 or 70. My parents are in this situation right now. They've run out of their IR, their, their, their income. Their, they live on Social Security now. They used to have some investments that they lived on. Retirement accounts, I think, are very important, um, especially since we don't know what's going to happen. We're, we can't be totally certain about Social Security. So traditional IRAs, SEP IRAs, they have now solo 401ks. All of these things will reduce your taxable income and you can save for retirement. Highly recommended. They're different though. Each of these is different. Roth IRA is also very good. You don't get a tax deduction, but it grows tax free. And when you take it out, you don't pay any more taxes on it. So if you're in a low income bracket, a Roth IRA is a good idea. The, the only drawback is that you can only put 6,000 in it a year. I think in the, actually in the next couple of years they're changing that, they're gonna let Roth, this Roth after tax be part of solo 401ks and SEP IRAs. So that cap will go away, sort of. Okay. Quickly, just about a SEP IRA. Don't put money in your SEP IRA until you know if you have a profit and how much your profit is. You cannot put money in a SEP IRA if you have a loss. So I have people who didn't know they were going to have a loss and they put money in a SEP IRA. Guess what? Had to take it out. So talk to your tax person before you put money in a SEP IRA. Okay, right on time. Let me let me skip ahead to the survey thing, I guess. I have I have other slides, but I'll just keep going. Anyway, actually, if anyone here wants to talk to me, I am here for this whole meeting. I'm here for you. I want to answer your questions. Small, big, whatever. I can be contacted after the meeting. I'll talk to you 30 I'll talk to you for hours for free. This is what I put on my my website. Free 30-minute consult. Okay. Anyway. 
Here's a, just a, a resource for you who do your own taxes. If you have your own system or your own person, that's fine. I wouldn't change anything. If you're looking for, uh, 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 this is an online system. If you write this whole thing down and you'll get, you'll get this in your email, but you can file any tax return, including Schedule C. Sometimes the free sites limit you. You, can, you can't have, um, you can't be above a certain income, or once it gets into a Schedule C, they start charging you, right? So this website that actually makes my tax software does every do-it-yourself tax return for a flat fee of 25 bucks, and it's, I think it's a good deal. Okay, and here's just extra things. I'm gonna skip through this. And I'll let this stay up there. Thanks for listening and not falling asleep and thanks for all the great questions. <laughs>